Uh, he is a PhD student at the German Internet Inter Institute, and he's working with Matthias Reilich, and his research revolves around emergency communications in intermittent and challenged networks. So all three presentations are recorded in this session, so uh, please start playing the presentation. Let's hope we can uh, hear it. Welcome to our talk on namespace and public key management in NDN. This is a systematization oh, okay. of the we we Eric, Thomas, and Matthias. This is Max. The reason that we chose this topic has to do with the okay. history. Okay, stop it. Stop it. Can you get it louder? Oh, it was, we need to get it louder. Uh, That's the next generation internet, a term which has been used to refer to different concepts throughout the past decades. As the internet commercialization was undergoing, um, this Netscape browser by introducing the a protocol which allows for the internet, the U.S. government started a project called the Next Generation Internet in 1996 to improve uh, internet. In 1998, at the State of the Union, um, the president uh, of the U.S. at that time, Bill Clinton, uh, expressed his support for that project by saying that we should enable all the world's people to explore the far reaches of cyberspace. Two years after that, Triad was introduced, a project that asserted that the main purpose of the Internet is content distribution. This put the first information object networking as we know it today. Various other projects were also introduced. It was introduced. The, the Internet Indirection in infra Infrastructure was Sorry. introduced. And finally, in 2006, Van Jacobsen's proposed oh, well, a famous uh, Google Talk yeah, and uh, put yeah. it as the third dissemination instead of conversation, as he put it, um, referring to TCP IP um, protocols. The question that we had was, is the next generation internet is already there? Have we reached that? And if not, why not? To answer that, we start uh, with an overview of NDN, which is the most prominent information centric networking. The idea is that a producer can announce a name on the network and associated data with that, and a consumer can inquire the network, um, ask the network to discover and retrieve the data only oh, 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 evolves around names. And if you take a closer look at names, even if not evident at first glance, you could see that NG names also can be separated into two segments, a global uh, network um, unique prefix and an application locally scoped uh, segment. This is something that we also have over the internet for URLs and email addresses, uh, where the DNS is the globally unique part of that name. When everything evolves around names, uh, the challenge that we have is how can we secure the binding between the name and, and, and the data so that uh, not everyone can claim any arbitrary name and publish data under that. Um, for that, we have the uh, possibility of having a namespace principle that owns a namespace and authorizes producers to publish name over there. Um, so the question is, how can a consumer know which producers are authorized? Basically, producers can sign data, which they do by default in NDN, um, so, and consumers can validate the signature using corresponding public keys. Um, the second question that we have here is, how can a consumer know that the public key is authentic. How can a consumer even fetch, retrieve that public key in a secure manner? Um, and if you want to avoid naive approaches, um, like the way PGP distributes, uh, distributes keys out, out of band for each person, um, we can use established approaches um, that delegate trust into trusted third parties and have them vouch for the authenticity of public keys and any data that might be bound to those keys by signing them, by certifying them. It is at this point that we claim uh, that 
If we want to be that next generation internet on a global scale, we have to attend namespace and public key management. Um, you would say Welcome to our talk on namespace and public key management in NDN. This is a systematization of knowledge talk by me, Puyan, Eric, Thomas, and Matthias. The reason that we chose this topic has to do with the history of information-centric networking and how it was advertised as a next generation internet, a term which has been used to refer to different concepts throughout the past decades. As the internet commercialization was undergoing, um, by introduction of Net Netscape browser, by introducing the SSL, uh, protocol which allows for secure uh, e-commerce on the internet. The U.S. government started a project called the Next Generation Internet um, in 1996 to improve uh, internet um, access and speed. In 1998, at the State of the Union, um, the president uh, of the U.S. at that time, Bill Clinton, uh, expressed his support for that project by saying that we should enable all the world's people to explore the far reaches of cyberspace. Two years after that, Triad was introduced, a project that asserted that the main purpose of internet is content distribution. This put the first stone for the information-centric networking as we know it today. Various other projects were also introduced. Dono was introduced. The, the internet in indirection infra infrastructure was introduced. And finally, in 2006, Van Jacobsen proposed CCN in his famous uh, Google talk um, and put it as the third generation of networking that focuses on dissemination instead of conversation, as he put it, um, referring to TCP IP um, protocols. The question that we had was, is the next generation internet is already there? Have we reached that? And if not, why not? To answer that, we start uh, with an overview of NDN, which is the most prominent implementation of information-centric networking. The idea is that the producer can announce a name on the network and associated data with that, and a consumer can inquire the network, um, ask the network to discover and retrieve the data only using its name. Everything here evolves around names. And if you take a closer look at names, even if not evident at first glance, we could see that Indian names also can be separated into two segments, a global uh, network um, unique prefix and an application locally scoped uh, segment. This is something that we also have over the internet for URLs and email addresses, uh, where the DNS is the globally unique part of that name. When everything evolves around names, uh, the challenge that we have is how can we secure the binding between the name and, and, and the data so that uh, not everyone can claim any arbitrary name and publish data under that. Um, for that, we have the uh, possibility of having a namespace principle that owns a namespace and authorizes producers to publish name over there. Um, so the question is, how can a consumer know which producers are authorized? Basically, producers can sign data, which they do by default in NDN, um, so, and consumers can validate the signature using corresponding public keys. Um, the second question that we have here is, how can a consumer know that the public key is authentic? How can a consumer even fetch, retrieve that public key in a secure manner? Um, and if you want to avoid naive approaches, um, like the way PGP distributes, uh, distributes keys out, out of band for each person, um, we can use established approaches um, that delegate trust into trusted third parties and have them vouch for the authenticity of public keys and any data that might be bound to those keys by signing them, by certifying them. It is at this point that we claim uh, that if we want to be that next generation internet on a global scale, we have to attend namespace and public key management. Um, you would say, are you sure? And you would say, yes. We took a look at 30 NDN applications uh, proposed and published uh, from back in 2015, the first uh, ACM ICN conference uh, up to 2021 and also uh, related venues. Um, and we see that each approach um, has its own requirements on names and naming, 
they want to have specific prefixes and so on and so forth. They use public key cryptography to uh, realize uh, authentication, access control, uh, confidentiality, and uh, so on. So yes, we would say we need these two uh, aspects and we need to attend to them on a global scale. We analyze namespace management on three terms, structure, allocation, and governance. If you take the example of DNS, we have a hierarchical uh, namespace that allows delegation or allocation of zones, complete smaller namespaces. The allocation is not persistent and lasts as long as the domain name is delegated. The security is provided by DNSSEC and every zone owner can further delegate parts of its own namespace to other parties. Um, the namespace is defined on a global scale uh, and is um, governed by, uh, in a centralized manner uh, by ICANN and other um, stakeholders. For public key management, we take a look at two aspects, the trust model and the key management approaches. For WebPKI, um, we have a hierarchical trust model that also allows for cross-certification. Uh, the private keys are generated and stored by the owners and are only certified by certification authorities, the so-called CAs. Um, the public keys, the LEAF certificates are um, distributed over web server, the CA uh, certificates are distributed um, over using trust stores and uh, specialized repositories. Um, the rollover for keys for LEAF certificates are instantaneous, you just swap the key on a web server. For CAs, uh, the trust store uh, maintainers uh, such as browser or OS vendors take care of that although there are um, RFC specifications for that. The revocation succeeds uh, using either a global directory such as certificate revocation lists um, or using online protocols such as um, OCSP. Having two, these two taxonomies allows us to uh, systematically analyze four approaches uh, proposed for NDN that allow for namespace and public key management at the same time. The first one is NDN public key management. This approach, um, an NDN technical report from 2015, first and foremost, defines uh, a naming scheme for um, certificates uh, in NDN. Each name is composed of four parts. The first part is the identity, denotes both the certificate owner and the namespace that it controls. The second one is a constant part called key. The third one is the key ID comparable to DNSSEC key tags um, that allows us to have a single key associated with, uh, multiple keys associated with a single identity. The last one version allows us to have different versions of the same public key uh, that might exist uh, due to renewal, for example. Here, to delegate a sub namespace, you just have to sign the public key of the new owner and publish the certificate under uh, the name of that sub uh, namespace. You can revoke certificates by publishing a self site certificate under its original name with an extra re revoked name segment at the end. And you can also revoke single uh, signatures, um, a feature that is not common in other uh, PKIs. A simple yet uh, very effective approach in the NPKM faces a number of challenges. Uh, the burden of key management and uh, public key uh, cryptography is put on the key owner. Um, for example, the key owner must regularly publish um, signature revocation notifications so the consumers know if at any given time uh, a signature has been revoked or not. Uh, the compromised keys can be used to suppress certificate or signatures re revocations um, and the verification on its own is very cumbersome. You have to not only check if signatures are valid but you have to also check if signatures are not retracted and you have to do this for every packet up um, to a trust anchor that is known to you. Moving on, trust schema is the um, de facto standard way to uh, manage keys uh, and namespaces uh, on NDN applications. The idea here is to define the so-called trust rules, um, relationships between 
name of data packages and the name of certificates that can be used to validate those packets. Here, you could see a simple rule um, allows users on their org IETF to publish under their own namespace. How do we know that if that's authentic? If they sign it with their own keys that um, corresponds to the pattern given on the right hand side of this trust rule. Um, such rules that uh, associate non-certificates with certificate names can be used to define namespace management and rules that uh, associate two certificate names and as such can be used to define authentication path up to a trust anchor are used to define public key management. Um, in this example, we can see that um, the certificate of um, users should be signed uh, by either admins or the Indian master. Having multiple rules uh, matching the same name also allows for multi-path authentication and enables in, in some um, a very flexible and fine granul granular uh, control of namespace and public key management. At the same time, there are a number of um, shortcomings. First of all, no key revocation is explicitly defined. We should take an existing approach, translate that into trust rules if possible, and um, add it to our trust schema. Um, since we don't know the uh, authentication path beforehand um, and trust schema um, allows for multi-path authentication, um, an adversary can uh, build a path that don't end uh, with a trust anchor and as such exhaust uh, resources on the consumer's end and uh, mount availability attacks. Um, there is no possibility that you delegate part of the name covered by a trust schema to another trust schema. And um, there is no synchronization between data and uh, corresponding trust schema. So if you have multiple trust schema from the consumer uh, perspective point of view, um, there is no way to know which one is the correct one for any given data. Uh, coming next is NDNSSEC. This is an approach that we proposed in um, a couple of years ago. The basic idea was to use the whole ecosystem, the technical, non-technical entities and organizations around the DNS to take care of both namespace and public key management for NDN. The reason that we could do that is that the um, that NDN names, or at least the global prefix, can easily be translated into to its corresponding um, um, DNS counterpart. NDNSSEC uh, works by um, looking at the global prefix of an NDN name, translate it into a DNS name, go over to DNS, um, follow the delegation, fetch all the DNS keys, look at the DNS keys that are um, marked with a special flag, um, fetch the key that is required. We can find that out using the key tag uh, that is mentioned in the NDN packet and use that key to validate the NDN packet. Um, the problem that this approach has is the complex maintenance of trust chains. Um, in a DNSSEC, basically you need a number of different records from different zones that you need to stitch together and build an um, authentication path. You have poor scalability performance uh, on DNSSEC. Research records of the same type are signed all together. And if you need to validate one, a single research record, you have to fetch all of them on their same type and then validate the signature. So in NDNSSEC, if you have like a thousand producers for a namespace and you want to fetch and validate um, a key for one of them, you have to fetch and validate all thousand keys before you can do that. Um, and finally, our solution relied on DNS uh, transport. Finally, the last and the oldest uh, proposal is to use identity-based cryptography um, to generate uh, key pairs from any arbitrary uh, strings, in this case, from producers' um, identities. For that, you would need um, a private key generator 
that can um, generate private keys upon request. So a producer would ask a PKG to uh, generate and um, hand a private key over. Um, and on the other hand, the consumers only need to know the public keys of the PKG um, and can generate public keys uh, on the fly for, for any given identity. A producer would then sign uh, a data packet using its own uh, key um, and the consumers generates the key and validates the packet. As you might uh, guess, the problem with this solution is scalability. The authors uh, propose to have multiple PKGs uh, for different domains and have their public parameters dis distributed using an existing um, PKI such as the NSSEC. Um, other authors um, have proposed to use hierarchical uh, identity-based cryptography where you have a hierarchy of uh, um, PKGs and uh, in case of NDN, the producer would then only need to interact with a single dedicated uh, PKG and the consumers only need to know the public parameters uh, of the root PKG and the rest would work um, the same. Um, and in this sense, somehow cater for the scalability. Um, the problem with both of these two implementations uh, is that the um, private keys are known to the PKG. So you don't have the non-repudiation uh, property that you would want to have. Um, you have a lack of namespace delegability because only PKGs can generate private keys and you have, although alternatives were proposed, you have a scalability um, problem. And finally, the, the biggest one in my eyes is that you cannot revoke a key, uh, a key, or you can revoke a key, but revoking a key means that you revoke a whole identity that cannot exist again, uh, or you need to change the parameters of the PKG altogether. We reach a point that we can say we have successfully launched the rocket of next generation internet, but we have some issues that we need to attend before we can reach that um, global scale that we need. Um, on the namesca namespace management uh, uh, front, uh, we see that application level names are being used on the um, network layer. Uh, we can see that current proposals uh, focus on the uh, application scope and the local scope. Um, we must acknowledge that internet names on that scale will be composed and are composed of two parts, a global and a local parts, and both of them require some kind of management. Um, and we should move away from um, custom PKIs that are on just an overhead for consumers. On the front of public key management, we need to have solid procedures of bootstrapping that works just out of the box and we have to address the problems of key renewals and key revocations. Uh, with that, I'm uh, going to end uh, this talk. I want to thank you for listening to watching this talk. And if there are any questions, if you have any critique, or if you want to uh, work with us, you can drop me a line at pfd.acm.org. I'm gonna stay around for the Q&A session. Thank you. you're muted at this point. But uh, stay, uh, stay okay. Uh.
Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Can, did you hear the question? Um, no. 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 The it was muted. Okay. So uh, you compare the trust uh, establishment in in Indiana to Sudzi S SDSI, which is a completely sort of. Uh, Distributed. Each each participant makes their own decisions about trust anchors and and what names semantics of names, right? Yes. But it seems like your tax taxonomy sort of requires uh, an authority or assumes an authority, some kind of centralized authority, to authorize the use of a prefix. Is that right, or have I misunderstood something? Um, the 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 namespace taxonomy, or. Well, you're just your presentation here, right? So you, um, you talk about okay. something being authorized, which implies that there's an authority to that that gives that permission. Got it. Um, this um, this is what I tried to put in the introduction. This uh, we had this discussion also with uh, Licia. Um, we what we were thinking at the time that we were. Uh, writing this paper was uh, regardless of how the application, each application on its own, how it's locally do stuff and take care of their trust management. If you want to go on a global scale, if you want to be like a viable uh, alternative for the internet, you have to um, have a, a, some measure uh, that you can reach like that scale as you do it on the internet. Um, which is not going to be the way that uh, Satsi works. So uh, the focus is on on this global scale, not like the small do it as you uh, go on um, approach of the uh, NDN. So what's uh, okay? What what's the relationship between scaling and having a, a global authority? Um, I'm not sure if I um, understand uh, the question. Well, um, in terms of pu public key management, like uh, um, um, the, the, you don't have that global authority. Uh, you have like your browser, your uh, operating system that like established a set of um, trust anchors. Um, there's a lot of them and, and you scale very well. Um, um, and um, at, at the same time, uh, you don't have like one single entity. It's organized in a centralized manner, but it's not like one single entity that's going to be a, um, a problem. Well, okay, I guess I'm thinking of DNSSEC, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, in DNS, uh, you're, you're using DNSSEC, which yeah. does have a single authority and a single root of trust, right? Assuming yes, you're using it Okay. Anybody else? Other question? Yeah, I have a question about comments. I think that uh, for name allocation, I think that I, I personally believe DNS is the way to go because we need to have globally unique uh, namespace. And for that, there's no replacement for uh, you call the centralizer now, so community manager uh, is a tree-ish structure to assure global uniqueness. At the same time, I think the trust management uh, need to go down the direction of SDSI. There, there's no central authority to decide which name you, you, you think is a good party and which name is a bad party. I think that the Indian security research is still at the very beginning. It's not even the end of the beginning yet. I, wish to, I hope that more people are actually going to come into this area to see how we can have inbound trust management as opposed to today's CAs, which is entirely external third party to manage the secure communications between two parties. They have, I mean, the CAs have no relation with the communication parties. Yeah, this is, I, I think that's a well known weakness. This is right? a fundamental problem, and well. therefore, I don't think CA direction is the right direction. I think we need to push down SDSI direction. How to make it a scale is a challenging challenge, and then we need to find that. I'm sure we'll find a ways to solve that problem.
Okay, yeah. any other questions? As I said, most of their comments and kind of uh, how, how the different view um, was uh, expressed in the paper. Okay, uh, no more than thank you, Poyan. Thank you, Ken. Okay, the next uh, paper is from uh, Tinyuan Yu, and Tinyuan is a PhD student in Lisha's group at UCLA, and his current research focuses on Indian security bootstrapping and certificate management. And this paper is on CERT Revoke, which is a certificate revocation framework. So, hit play, please. Hello everyone, my name is Tian Yuan Yu. Today I'm going to present a joint work from UCLA and the City University of Hong Kong, CERT Revoke, a certificate revocation framework for named data networking. Recently, the model of Indian Trust Zone was proposed and has become a security design pattern. In the Trust Zone model, any Indian entity can create a trust anchor and all entities under the same trust anchor make a trust zone. Then the owner of the trust anchor T is the controller of this trust zone. For example, here is an application slash Indian feed. It has its own trust zone. And we have three entities inside, Indian feed controller, Alice, and Bob. In order to enable secure communications, Indian feed controller needs to bootstrap both Alice and Bob with their trust anchor, certificate, and trust schema. Now Alice wants to share a document to Bob. After receiving a document, Bob executes trust schema to validate that data. In order to figure out how that validation step happens, we need to take a step back and look at how the data signing chain was derived at the first place. Here is the trust anchor. The self sign certificate with KID 001 and version number one, owned by the Indian feed controller. It assigns Alice certificate slash Indian feed slash Alice under key ID 002, then setting the issuer component to be Indian feed slash Indian feed dash controller and the key locator point back to the trust anchor. The Alice further uses her certificate to sign the shared document slash Indian feed slash Alice slash document slash screenshot appended with a timestamp. When Bob validates the screenshot, she, Bob needs to go through the validation chain indicated by the key locators until reaching the trust anchor. Now here comes a question. What if Alice is compromised? When her certificate should not be trusted. In this case, how will protect Bob from mistrusting Alice's certificate? A single solution is using short lived certificate within the entire trust zone and wait for Alice's current certificate expires, but still they need to wait. Also, not all certificates are very easy to be short lived. Therefore, we still need a certificate revocation design that enables Indian feed the controller revokes Alice certificate and then let Bob knows about this revocation event. For any certificate revocation design, there are always three basic design questions. Who can revoke, how to revoke, and how to check the revocation status. All the answers in such revoke is that given a certificate, its issuer and owner can revoke. They revoke the certificate through publishing revocation record. This certificate consumer checks the revocation status while trying to fetch those revocation records. Our three answers directly relate to the cert revoke design functions. First, we need to validate revocation legitimacy so that only issuer and owner can revoke the certificate. Second, we need to maintain revocation recording. Such revoke needs a log that persistently records the revocation events within the trust zone. Third, such revoke needs to provide record accessibility. 
therefore, the log the revocation records are publicly accessible. With the three design functions in mind, we designed such to revoke with system model as follows. The certificate issuer and owner, they are the revokers. They generate revocation records and send to the ledger. The ledger provides an immutable data storage for those revocation records. Then the checkers communicate with the ledger to learn the revocation status of a certificate. As we can see, the central part of the design is the revocation record. So we have to take a close look, close look at data format of this revocation record. Here we have a certificate slash ending feed slash alice slash key under key ID 002 issued by ending feed dash controller version one. Now here is a revocation record. One can clearly see the relationship between the two names. We replace the keyword key in the certificate name with keyword revoke, then append a revoker information component at the end of the name. The revocation record contains revocation timestamps, a revocation reason, and the public, public key hash of the revoked certificate. We use trust schema to infer the revocation legitimacy. Trust schema says, and then feed the controller is allowed to revoke Alice certificate because in the feed controller is the issuer for it. Our schema says the record assigning key has to be the same with the certificate assigning key. Our schema also says revoker information component has to either equal to the issuer component in the original certificate name or has to be a hard coded string self indicating this is the owner generated certificate. We choose this naming convention for two reasons. First, it enables automatic name construction when fetching revocation records. When we have a certificate in hands, there are only two possibilities of record naming, either with a suffix component self or a suffix component same as the issuer component. The rest of record checking would be very simple. Just express two interest and a fetch. The second advantage is that we can easily leverage trust schema to ensure revocation legitimacy. For example, trust schema accepts slash Indian feed slash key as the record data producer, but rejects slash Indian feed slash Bob if he wants to revoke any certificate. He cannot because he is neither the certificate owner or the issuer. Going back to the big picture. We have in the feed controller, Alice and Bob. Alice get compromised. So in the feed controller decided to revoke her certificate. Now we have discussed about how controller revokes Alice certificate via generating a revocation record. Remember that in our system model, the revoker needs to submit the record to the ledger. And the checker, now is Bob, needs to communicate with the ledger to learn about the revocation status. For, starting from the next slide, we will talk about the record submission. When the revoker wants to submit a record to the ledger, it first sends out a notification interest to notify the ledger. Here is my prefix, and I have a record to submit. In return, the ledger sends another interest forwarded back to the revoker to fetch the record. In response to, the, to this I2, revoker encapsulates the record into D2 and reply. When ledger receives this D2, it executes the trust schema to validate the record is legitimately signed. Then reply the first notification interest I1 with an acknowledgement data packet, which encapsulates the record submission status and it is signed by the ledger. The revoker side also executes the trust schema to validate the acknowledgement data packet. From the figure, we can see that trust schema ensures data legitimacy on both sides. So that ledger only accepts a legitimately signed revocation record and the revoker can know it is submitting record to the correct party. 
Then lastly, how Bob checks the revocation status. As we have discussed before, the record naming convention simplifies this step. Once we have the certificate name, we do name construction and obtain two possible record names. The checkers express two interests respectively, trying to fetch the record. If the ledger does have the record, ledger can give back the exact record data. But what if that record does not exist? Then in this case, what should the ledger do? How can we convey this information of non-existence? Our solution is using application layer NAC. An application layer NAC is a data packing. Since we want to indicate the data of specific name does not exist, we have to make NAC data name directly related to the original data name requested. So we appended a keyword NAC after the original requested data name. Secondly, the non-existence indicator must have timestamps and lifetimes because that data may exist in future. Also, the cache lifetime needs to be carefully considered because longer the TTL, the more you benefit from the cache, also the higher security risk. Finally, this data needs to be signed by the ledger instance. So far, we have gone through the framework workflow. We did a proof of concepts C++ implementation of Cert Revoke and evaluate Cert Revoke to show our system is practical to be deployed and does not impose significant revocation checking overhead. We started our evaluation from a well-known fact that is in-network caching reduces data retrieval latency. We are aware that there are multiple factors contribute to this performance improvement. And in our evaluation, we focus on investigating how data freshness period affects record checking latency. We set up our experiment topology as the figure shows. We have two checkers connected to two folders respectively. Then the two folders are connected to a folder where the ledger is connected to. In our evaluation, we tried both deploying the ledger on the local internet of folder one and on the ending testbed and remotely connected to border one. Every second, the two checkers randomly select a certificate from the same set of 100 certificates and check the revocation status. In this experiment, we assume every certificate has the same possibility of being selected. We measure the latency of revocation record checking and normalize them against average, average run trip time. Run -trip time from the ledger to checker. Our evaluation result shows as we increase the net lifetime in cache, both normalized delay and ledger workload decrease. The normalized record checking latency gradually decreases by half and so does the, in, the number of interests received by the ledger. We can see that in-network caching are benefiting both sides. For the checker, you have lower latency and for the ledger, you have lower workload. We also consider different certificate popularity in real applications, because generally speaking, as more popular the content, more popular the signer certificate. In this experiment, we assumed the certificate and the content popularity share the same zip distribution. Again, we measured the normalized latency and ledger workload. The results show the converted value further decrease. In-network caching reduces the record checking latency by 80%. From the evaluation, we prove such revoke is practical to be, to be deployed by wisely tuning the data lifetime in cache. Certificate revocation is not a new topic. Today's internet has a long history dealing with it. At the beginning, Certificate authorities gather all revoked certificates into a list, a certificate revocation list, and host that list under a well-known URL as a file. But the problem is that as the time goes, that file may go large. Later, people came up 
the idea of OSSP to do online certificate status checking based on HTTP. But still, even on IP's point-to-point -point communication model, the OSSP response only has very limited accessibility to the broader internet or internet applications. So to revoke, however, targeting at addressing Indian certificate revocation problem using naming convention to design revoking records per certificate. So to revoke utilizes trust schema to enforce revocation legitimacy and leverages in network caching to provide a better revocation record accessibility. In conclusion, certificate revocation is part of Indian certificate management and certificate revocation requires more attention in this community. This, revoc this work presented a certificate revocation framework so to revoke leveraging Indian's basic design ideas, naming conventions, trust schema, and in-network caching. So to revoke systematically validates revocations and enables efficient distribution of certificate revocations. We also encourage people to read our paper for more detailed discussions. Especially in our paper, we discuss the relationship between trust schema and our search revoke. We discuss how trust schema makes the big picture of Indian certificate revocation fundamentally different from today's Expo 509 certificate revocation practice. We also talk about certain books assumption on trust schema. And we also talk about what kind of trust schema can significantly reduce or even eliminate the need of revocation. In, in the paper, we also bring up remaining questions and the future works. Even such revoke relies on the ledger to provide immutable data storage for revocation records. Now the questions become how to design that distributed ledger. Also, given such revoke relies on network caching to provide revocation record accessibility, then how we mitigate cache poisoning in the network? This could also be another open question. Thanks for listening. Yes, I have a question. So uh, you highlighted in your related work slide that from your perspective, it's an advantage that you have a single revocation uh, document for every certificate. But from a latency perspective, that means for every you know data packet I get, if I want to verify it, buy it, I verify the signature, but first I need to get I need to fetch from the ledger the revocation file for that uh, signature to see if it has been revoked or not. So in traditional way of using certificate revocation, this has the advantage I, I fetch the revocation list once. As soon as I get the signature. I can verify locally without needing to fetch another, get another uh, data packet from a, a different source. So in your case, if the letter is, you know, not reachable or has a, you know, latency problem, um, that may take some time. So I wonder, I'm not criticizing the design, I just wonder if it's possible to, to extend your design in a way that you can fetch, that you can prefetch several certificates for a certain Prefix was something in advance just to make things faster, right? If you're on a mobile network and for every signature you need to fetch again the revocation, the server revoke the data item, ooh, you know, take some time. There's something yeah. like the signature for the key. Did you did you hear the question, Jenny? Right, you're right. It's for the key. But if I want to verify the signature, I need to know if the key is still valid or not, right? So what's what's this? You oh, sorry, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. No, you're right. Okay, we we cannot hear you. You're muted, I think. Oh, really? Uh, can people hear me now? No, your volume is low. Uh, better, better. That's better. Can you hear me now? Is yeah. it better now? Oh, okay. Okay. Thanks. Uh, I think there are two things. One is that definitely, 
uh, we won't verify or check the revocation records for every data. And uh, in the paper, we said uh, we believe that the short lived certificate is the right way to go. Uh, so that for short lived certificate, because once you get the certificate, you, you can directly tell if it is a short lived certificate or a long time, long lifetime certificate. For short lived certificate, uh, we encourage not to check it because you may yeah, incur some performance problem. And for we yeah for long lived certificate you better check the revocation record and still there are two things that first I think uh, for performance maybe we can uh, borrow some design uh, from today's OSSP stapling that is you 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 like you attach that kind of NAC packet into your application protocol and the other can directly validate okay your certificate is not revoked. And the second, the second uh, part of the of the answer is that um, ideally the cache should solve the problem. In DNS, you didn't prefetch anything. Your local stock resolver will will have all the revocation records, or not revoc all the DNS records that uh, you you frequently ask about. So ideally, we should this framework should have the um, say. Even yeah, same performance with DNS because in each hop you can catch the data. But prefetch could solve the problem. I definitely agree. Okay. Uh, in the interest of time, I think we're going to take other questions on Slack. Okay. So thank you, Tianyuan. Uh, so the next paper is uh, a type theoretic model of the uh, Indian wire encoding, and it'll be presented by Xinyu Ma. And he is, I think, a PhD student at UCLA, right? Yes. Okay, take it away. Hello, everyone. Today, I'm going to talk about our work, um, the type theoretical model on the MTLV encoding. So, our paper is about our preliminary work on the MDMTLV encoding, which include we proposed uh, first a basic model for the MDM decodable types, and we define the requirement of the correctness of the encoding and decoding functions. And we want to discuss some subtle issues in MDMTLV encoding. And our goal is to draw people's attention to the TLV encoding and to get some for the results down. So first, let's talk about the NDM TLV encoding. So TLV, just as its name suggests, it's type length value encoding, which means that first we put a TLV type number for a field, and then we put uh, some bytes represent the length of the field value, and eventually we put the value of this field. So what's different from uh, NDN TLV and other TLV is that the NDN TLV has uh, variable numbers for both uh, TLV type and uh, TLV length. This gives us more flexibility and vulnerability over TLS and other protocols, but the cons is that it's, it's more effort to handle. For example, if we have a Data with which is 256 bytes, then the TLV type and length part of the data would be like this. The TLV type part is 06 at the data type, and the TLV length part would be FD, which marks that the next two bytes uh, the, represent the TLV length, and the next two bytes are 0100, which is uh, 256 bits. The encoding and decoding are uh, uh, reverse to each other. So the encoding is that we gave an object in the programming language, like uh, it typically can be an instance of uh, something like a C++ class or some struct. And the encoding function will output uh, a binary string that represents the encoded object. And the decoding function, that's the reverse, it takes an input of this encoding the bytes and returns an object of the, like an uh, instance of the class in the language you want. Here we have some correctness requirements for this. 
First is it must be reverse to each other. Like when you encode some object, you decode it back, you should get the same object. And the second is the decode should handle improper inputs because this binary string can be some random binary string and the decode must uh, detect this is wrong input and fail properly. The existing implementation, so for example, we use uh, NDSXX. The NDSXX is <coughs> encoding and decoding function is manually written for every type. Like this is copied from the interest part. So like the interest has a whole hint, must be fresh, can be perfect, so then fails. So in the encoding function, it's just uh, the programmer manually writes the code which puts the, those fields into the encoding wire. So it, it works, but this gives many lines of code for every type. And also the correctness is uh, done by test to ensure it. So we have to a test for each type. And if sometimes if the test does not cover everything, there may be problems. Till now, and the exact text is fine, but if you want to improve them, the goal here is first, we want to have some automatic derivation, which is like you gave the description of the types uh, class or struct, then you automatically generate the encoding algorithm and decoding algorithm. And the second part is we really want our code to be uh, proved to, to be proven correct instead of just this test to cover it. So to have this goal, we need to have a model for the uh, encoding and decoding. So how do we have the model? Uh, the first step is we need to formally define what is uh, encoding and decoding. So for encoding, it is quite easy. Suppose the type T is the uh, type we want to encode. So it's, the encoder will take an object of type T and returns the encoded wire of type by the string. For decoding, it's a little uh, complicated because the decoding may fail, and also the in the wire it may contain more than one object. So if the decoding decodes the first object, it must tell the program that where it's the decoded object ends, so the program can move forward with the rest of the wire. So the type of decoding we think is like this: the input is just a where the band by the string, but the output is uh, it's first it's optional because the function may fail, and when it's success, we should return both the decoded object and the rest of the wire, which contains the bytes that we didn't decode. So how do we define the correctness of this thing? First, it's a decode function must handle improper input. This is done by we check, we check that the decode is a total function. That is, it's for every input, we check that the decode function does not fall into an infinite loop and it does not have uh, memory access issues. It does not crash. Then it's, it is good. Then the second is we need to check the encode and decode are inverse to each other, which we can, can be done by we define a mathematical relation. The uh, relation we define is as this. First is uh, understandability of the thing, which means for every object of the uh, type T, T is what we want to encode. We first encode it, which always success, and then we decode the thing. The decoding of the encoded object must exist, so it returns some value instead of fail, and this value should contain exactly the same object V, and it should return no. Uh, extra bytes because we decoded everything. The second relation is the uh, uniqueness of the expression. Like that is for every byte string we encoded to uh, we, we put input to the decode function. Okay. Suppose that the decode x we it returns some object b with the rest of the wire that is y, then we encode the, the object b back then we should get exactly the same bytes that we used to decode. So we attach the rest of the wire and we get 
the original input x. But there is one problem that is the first one must hold everywhere, but the second one may not sometimes. Yeah, you, if the both one and two holes, then they are just perfectly bijection. But sometimes uh, the encoding and decoding is not the bijection relation. For example, uh, uh, for the interest of NDN, we have a field called interest lifetime, and its uh, type number is COC. So suppose the interest has a lifetime of 1024 milliseconds, then the correct way to encode it is we use two bytes to encode it because it only needs 0400. But if we receive the packet that uses four bytes to encode it, should we just fail on parsing this packet? I think probably the, we do not need to fill on this because this is really a matter issue and we can understand what it means. So if we handle it in this way, then the result would be when we're parsing this object, we parse uh, six bytes. But when we encode it back, we will got four bytes. This uh, type will uh, less uh, reduce to two on the two bytes encoding the person. Uh, 24 second which is my time. So this unique things of expression may not hold. And our final goal would be we automatically derive the encoding and encoding algorithm from our model. Based on our definition, we have already made a model for the TLV encoding types and algorithms, and we have uh, uh, implemented in the F star, which is uh, theorem prover, and we use it to check the, the correctness of our encoding and decoding algorithm. So please refer to the paper for details. And our goal is eventually we automatically derive the encoding or decoding code into C++ or .NET so that people can directly call this code. So there is no need to manually write it, uh, manually write the encoding and decoding part like CXX2, and it's proven to be correct as long as the theorem prover is correct. For the language that's not support CSFI or .NET, one may, well, one may translate the true the FSR code and use the automatically derived code as uh, some tool that can help the testing. Because you have the correct code, so you can uh, use fuzzy test with automatically generate a lot of uh, test cases and we'll check if they have different output. So by developing this uh, uh, TLV model, we have some findings that we find some issues in the TLV coding. First is about the signature. Signature is also one uh, new thing in NDN TLV that we find that this signature part have some complicated dependency because first the signature cannot be computed before encoding because it's computed based on the encoded wire. And then the signature length depends on its value because in some uh, algorithm we use ASM.1 encoding to encode the signature value. And what's the worst is the total length depends on the length of the signature. And the length of the total length field depends on the signature length, which gives a figure like this. We uh, suppose this is a data packet. So at first we have a data type and then we have a data length. And then the, the for the data value part, it contains the fields and the signature value. But the thing here is to compute the signature, we have to have encoded fields. And the length of the uh, signature depends on the encoded fields and the length of the packet depends on the length of signature and the, even the because this TLV lens uses a variable encoding so the length of this lens field itself would depends on the encoded field to compute it depends on signature and eventually depend, depends on the encoded fields so now the problem comes is if we want to pre-allocate the buffer for this data object to encode then what is the size of the buffer to allocate? And if the length of this part uh, is variable, then how do we know that where should we put the encoded fields? Because 
when they encode those fields, the uh, total lens uh, cannot be computed, and we don't know the length of it. So this leaves us a trade-off. That is, we have to choose either to waste some time to do an extra copy, or we waste some space. But by waste time, I mean, first we just encode those fields without allocate the buffer for the whole data packet. And after we encoded the fields, we allocate the big buffer to contain the whole object, the, the whole data object, and then put everything there. But by doing this, we have to copy the encoded data. But with space, that means we allocate a buffer that is large enough, which can contain the maximum size of signature. And after that, we recall those fields from the user middle of the packet, which uh, have enough space to hold lens. And then we put the, we compute the signature and put the signature here. And eventually we compute the lens and put the type of lens in the middle of the buffer. But the problem is we just use some extra many memory. And the, because the length of this lens field is, uh, variable so the memory is unaligned, which can cause some performance loss in the RDM or something. This is an uh, interesting tool over fun. The second one is the uh, app. We find that the application and the forwarder have different requirements in encoding and decoding. Like the eventually goal for application is uh, is to extract useful information. So for those unrecognized fields that the application does not understand, it it's safe to drop those fields because no one else will uh, consume that information. But it's for forwarder, the forward, the goal of the forwarder is to forward the packet as is. So it must preserve all our recognized fields. So the signature, the application needs really to sign and verify, but the forwarder is just ignore the signature most of the time. And the application needs to parse all fields because of course it needs to extract useful information and really parse this packet into the class or strict in the programming languages. And because the application has a lower performance requirement, so the extra copying is allowed. But for forwarder, the forwarder only cares about uh, some necessary fields that used to forward the uh, uh, packet header. And to achieve a higher performance, generally we require we want to have no copy as possible as we can. And the application needs encoding for sure, but the forwarder only needs encoding when it's unable to modify the packet and set. That is, uh, suppose we want to deduct some, <coughs> we want to drop a uh, forward hint or deduct the interest in length time, then if we can do it on site, that is, we directly modify the wire instead of decode and encode it again, then we should do it downside. This suggests us that the, since the application forwarding may need very different encoding and decoding mechanism, we think that probably we should develop different model and different library for application and forward use. The last thing we found is we want to discuss is about the domain specific language to describe the KLE model. And in the old Python uh, PYNDN2, a Python NDN library, it uses protobuf. It works fine because protobuf has a very similar structure as an NDN PLV object, but except that they cannot handle the name or the, especially the signature. Uh, for this, the one solution is uh, the PYNDN2 uses is we just give up on signature, which means we use protobuf language on all application protocols, which is does not have a signature, but they do not use it on data or interest. The second solution is to modify the protobuf language a little bit to allow the notation of fields. So for example, we can, if you modify the language a little bit, we can add a covered keyword to indicate that those uh, fields that is covered by signature, or maybe like this, we use brace to surround the fields that is covered by signature. That's about domain-specific language. Well, 
So our future work is first, we want to finish our automatic derivation so we can really use our proved code in, uh, in the client library. And second, it is really good if we can propose a domain-specific language for our MDM TLV so people do not need to <coughs> use. So people can just write in the DSL and our tool can generate the automatic generate encoding and coding code for it. And we want to refine our model to uh, adapt the signature and uh, recognize fields. And we want to really <coughs> examine the, the, uh, what's the forwarder needs. And we want to propose a model and algorithms specific for the forwarding pipeline. That's all for today. Thank you. So are there any questions? So uh, I have a question. The um, uh, you you show that your uh, well you, you prove correctness of your decoding algorithm by showing it's a total function. So if someone crafts a malicious or intended to be malicious uh, wire representation uh it 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 is it defines some output for that but uh is that really is that sufficient i mean it seems like uh unless you can prove that your generated code from your uh decoder algorithm is is correct you you know it's it's always a gap between the model and the implementation, right? That leads to security problems. So I wonder if you could comment on that. Yeah, so our final goal is we want to derive the implementation code from our pool. So uh, as this is a preliminary work, we really didn't uh, didn't do that. But our final goal is we derive that uh, implementation code and directly use that code. So the gap between proof and the implementation is, uh, is uh, done by an uh, automatic tool instead of some human beings. So we can assume that the implementation is correct as uh, it proved. Okay, uh, I have another question. So you use type theory. I mean, in, in many languages, you would define a grammar and then use sort of well-known tools to generate a parser for that. So how come you didn't do it? Why, why can you not do it that way? Uh, sorry, why can we do uh, what? Can you repeat that? Can I, is, it, is there something about the TLV encoding that means you can't write a grammar that I could, I could hand to Yak and then generate a, a compiler from that? Oh uh, yeah, we plan to have a domain-specific language, so you can describe the TLV structure in that language, and uh, we kind of automatically derive the derive the encoding and decoding function. So the answer to your question is no. You can. It's just a, it's a different way. You could do that. Yeah. So why do it this way instead of that way? And at least the the way it was done is reasonably convenient. You don't need the external tool to do the calculation, but you already have some functionality built in, especially when some specific languages have a, I'm blanking the one, uh, the main that we're using. Uh, it's just really easy to have a already ready framework and you plug in a very small specification and no external tools necessary. It's, it's very, very nice approach of uh, actually even with the encoding. This is the, uh, you're talking about the F star uh, kind of approach? Or? I mean, the one I remember was the C++ the template, but that's not the same one, but there was a, the other one. Or, uh, I just have a comment. I actually tried exactly what you said. Uh, we can uh, use a backdoor from, uh, write, write it as a dot dot way and use a parser. The problem is that uh, syntactically, it will be correct, but semantically, we need, uh, for example, the length. Uh, we need it to make sense. We can't just, like, 
Semantically, the whole thing is just one TLV that still makes sense. Let's see. Uh, okay. So you would have you have, the have, the, going to you have, have the consistency requirements or the semantic uh, constraints. Well, wow. yeah, you you can't use the parser to get the semantics out of it. It's just the syntax. Right. Okay. So, um, all right. Any other questions? All right. Thank you. I think it's time for lunch. So thanks all. Let's thank all of our speakers. Again. And I guess we're getting back to the auditorium after lunch. Uh, Toru said he wasn't, they were going to try. We were, he wasn't quite sure. But they sent the instructions at the time. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'm not yet. So we're eating lunch down here like we did yesterday, right? Yeah. yeah.